Great, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Today, we will be presenting Observability at the Edge with Fastly and Datadog presented by Simon Wisto from Fastly and Aaron Kalin from Datadog. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we will get to as many questions as we can. This webinar will also be recorded and distributed. Now I will hand it off to Simon from Fastly. Hi, uh, my name is Simon Wisto. I'm a founder at uh, Fastly and uh, I've done a lot of jobs there, but my current job title is VP of Strategic Initiatives. And hi there, I'm Aaron Kalin. I'm a techno technology evangelist over at Datadog. I like uh, talking to people about computers <laughs> and tech in general. <laughs> there you go, I can keep going. <laughs> so uh, just before we start, as the agenda said, we're going to do a little discussion of what uh, FASI is and what Datadog is. And then uh, we're going to go on to an example of how you can use uh, FASI and Datadog together. And then Aaron's going to give a demo uh, and then we're going to announce some, some new stuff. So um, some of you may or may not have heard of FASI, um, but basically we are behind the, some of the best of the web. Um, if you wake up in the morning and you read the New York Times or uh, work out what, uh, what uh, Hogwarts house you are on, uh, on BuzzFeed, or you read Vogue or GQ, uh, pay for something with Stripe, uh, or argue some with someone on Reddit, or um, technically, I suppose, also drink Budweiser, although if you drink Budweiser in the morning, then you know, we probably should have a conversation, then uh, behind all those things, you're using Fastly. So, Fastly was started basically out of frustration with existing sort of content delivery networks. Um, they'd been designed around a really late 90s view of the web. Um, so they were kind of black boxes that you threw static content in, like images or JavaScript, uh, and you had no, de uh, no way of knowing what was going on. Uh, if you wanted to make a change to a configuration, it took hours. Or sometimes you even had to book like professional services at hundreds of dollars an hour, and that could take days or even weeks to make any changes. Um, and when you wanted to update content, you either had to wait for the TCL, the time to live to, to expire. So then you always had this balance of like, do you have a short time to live so that you can, uh, you can change stuff quickly? Or do you have a long time to live so that you have better caching performance? Or you had to fiddle with cache busters and URLs. So Fancy kind of came out of that. Um, Fancy was designed from the ground up to cache dynamic content, including like personalized content or stuff that was event driven, um, as well as static on uh, static assets. Uh, content could be dated either individual assets or um, collections of assets by grouping them together in on average about 150 milliseconds. And instead of having to wait 24 hour lot of 24 hours for logs to be shipped to you, um, they arrived in real time. Um, but none of this would have been any use if you couldn't move your logic away from your origin servers and onto our edge uh, compute platform. Um, otherwise, every time you wanted to do A-B testing or have a paywall or uh, a, a queuing system, a sort of a, a, um, a, uh, a waiting room for your uh, for e-commerce platforms or do bot detection or any kind of uh, sort of non-trivial logic, then you'd have to go back to your origin. And that would completely obviate the point of having a CDN. So where are we now? Um, we were founded in 2011 and we have a little over 600 employees now. Um, we do about 600 billion requests a day. Uh, we ship about 15 trillion log lines a month and we have 70 million lines of code uh, deployed on our edge servers. And our network is now up to about 74 terabits per second capacity. This is sort of uh, as of recently. Fassi sits in between you and your users uh, and where it makes their experience faster and more consistent. And it allows you as a customer of ours to scale. It protects you from attack and it hopefully saves you money as well. Um, and because we're geographically closer to all your users, we can help with routing too. We can act as a load balancer for individual machines or entire data centers. We can route users to different regions for performance advantages, such as sending your West Coast users to Amazon US West, your East Coast users to Amazon US East, and your European users to Amazon US EU, EU Central. Uh, we can fail over data centers, say in the completely unlikely event that US East goes down, which never happens. Um, 
And we can route based on compliance reasons as well, which is really useful in this kind of post GDPR world. Um, and we could even stitch seamlessly stitch together multiple cloud providers or even do hybrid cloud setups, so your data center plus like various different cloud services or any other uh, software as a service third party. Um, and we can even let you migrate from one architecture to another without your users ever knowing. And from that privileged position in the middle of your network, we can see almost everything that's going on. So apart from our queryable historical stat store, we also have, and our real-time stats API, which we'll see a little bit later, we also have an incredibly configurable logging system. Um, basically, you can log anything you want from the request and the response in almost any format you want and get it sent in real time to uh, a, a third party. Um, you can quickly find problems with delivery no matter where in the request or response it happens. Uh, you can cross-correlate with other sources. Uh, you can send different log lines depending on circumstances because they can have conditions attached to them. So for example, you can have a much more verbose log lines if you're logging an error than if you're just logging a successful request. Um, and if you're somebody like a video uh, provider, you can even do really complicated stuff like create a new log entry for every single manifest request uh, and for every single segment delivered and every player event and all have it send them all to the same database, which is incredibly powerful. All right, and now I'd like to hand it over to Aaron and to just talk more about Datastog. Yeah, what's up, folks? Uh, so some of you who are on, on this call now probably know what Datadog is, but I'll still give you a brief overview of kind of what we are and what we do and sort of where Fastly fits into that. Um, so we're an observability platform that gives you uh, full visibility around, across your organization and all the different things you deployed into the cloud or bare metal, wherever it happens to live. Uh, so we used to say the, uh, the several, like the three pillars of observability, but the main thing that we're providing is, you know, a place to collect all the, the metrics and stats coming off of your systems. Um, we also do performance tracing. So if you have an application in the cloud or multiple applications in the cloud, we can show you how they're performing and then also correlate that information together with not just those metrics of what's going on, the performance of the application itself. Um, and as uh, Simon was talking about, we have logging also baked into this as well, because logging gives you that additional level of detail into what's going on and, and maybe why those particular stats are, are showing you a certain thing. Um, you go to the next slide there, yep. Yeah. So this is also the, the, the part where Fastly comes in. Uh, we have a lot of integrations out of the box. Uh, as you can see there, Fastly's in the bottom left, but we have tons and tons and tons that just cannot fit on this slide. Um, and we change and add more every day. We enhance some of them. Uh, the Fastly one has gotten even better, which we will announce later on in this call. Um, the, the thing that you can get out of Fastly with the, this integration too is a lot of the metrics information. Um, we'll talk about how logging works and all that with the Fastly platform. But all these different integrations out of the box uh, will auto detect a lot of them now that, that has just uh, recently shipped. Um, but you can, uh, if you attach the Datadog agent to your infrastructure, we will try to do our best to figure out what exactly uh, you have going on in your infrastructure. It could be that you're running some Java apps or some Go apps. Maybe you're deployed in Kubernetes. We can do uh, auto-instrumented auto Kubernetes, uh, containers, et cetera. All that just comes right out of the box. We'll even give you some dashboards to get you started if you're not really sure what to keep tabs on and monitor. And as I was mentioning before with the application performance monitoring, a thing we've recently enhanced as well is we have network performance monitoring that goes into that. So we can also see the sort of linkage between all of your different services. Because these days, a lot, a lot of different companies are deploying microservices versus just a single service. There's usually a group of them that all work in tandem to deliver some kind of request. Even when Fastly is you know, being the, the proxy in front of all of that, your applications also do a lot of that heavy, heavy lifting. But how that application does all that, uh, even across things like serverless and all that stuff, linking them together and getting kind of a visual context of what's going on is super, super helpful. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the, the nice thing that we, we have on top of all this is once all the, those metrics come into our platform or those signals come in there, we have things like anomaly detection to kind of show you where some problems might be happening, things that are out of the ordinary. You can even use this to power some of the different monitors. So if there's some weird out of the ordinary stuff, you can get alerted to it and be like, hey, this might be something that you need to look at. Um, this also feeds into the, the newer product that we've announced. Uh, if you go to the next slide there. Um, we, we also have uh, security uh, as a newer uh, thing that we just launched. Uh, so this lets you keep tabs on specific security signals, as we call them. Uh, so whenever a, a set of search queries uh, sort of trigger and everything, 
You can uh, add some dimensions to that, of course, as well. You can set some rules to you know, set severity and all that stuff. It's somewhat like alerting, except you're looking very specifically at uh, incoming security signals. Um, there's already a integration with Fastly, which we'll show uh, in the demo later to show you how that sort of uh, interacts with everything. And then from there, you can do all the correlation to kind of drill down to what the security sort of signal was. And if you have all of our other uh, you know, parts of the product integrated, you can look at the log trace that generated that. And then you can maybe look at the, an APM trace that would have been in, in, impacted or interacted by that particular type of interaction. Uh, but you can also say like alert your security team if uh, they're keeping tabs on what's going on with your app. So this way you can see any sort of attacks that might be coming down the pipe or people who are looking to potentially attack you. This would be where you can start uh, keeping tabs on that and going into say the Fastly product to, to handle that. So we're gonna give a couple of examples. Um, so this is an example of something that actually happened to us. Um, so we were uh, the one of the streaming video uh, uh, providers for a very, very large sporting event. And um, we, uh, this was a fairly typical setup in the fact that we can, uh, we can cache the, the video segments. And so that works for either video on demand or live, um, uh, or live video. And uh, we can get, we can send logs back to a logging system based on everything that we see that's coming from the origin, everything that we see that's coming from the client. So we can do things, we can see things like what browser they're viewing, uh, viewing but also where, where they're coming from, uh, what type of network they're coming over, what their TCP retransmission rates, uh, all kinds of things. Um, but also we can sit there in front uh, and do what we call a synthetic, uh, um, a, syn a, a synthetic route, which is one that has no origin server, just something that is done entirely in Fastly. And we were collecting stats from players and then feeding all that back into a logging system, which allows us to cross correlate all those things as they come in. And so during the middle of the event, there was a couple of sort of messages that kind of came up on Twitter that said, oh, some people had been noticing problems somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. And we, um, it was nothing, we couldn't really see anything um, on the graphs, but we could, you know, if you have more than one person is talking about the same thing, then we definitely wanted to dig into it. And by cross-correlating all those things, we were able to diagnose what the problem was and root round it and everything started working again. But we can also have an example of something working with Datadog. So this is a fairly typ uh, typical setup for a server. You've got uh, Fastly sitting in front of an origin server. Um, it's uh, fetching any uncached content or any really, really heavily personalized content from the server. And you've got regular traffic coming from browsers and everything's going fine. And we're feeding the logs in real time to Datadog. And then some sort of bad guy comes along and starts trying to do malicious traffic, whether that's uh, layer seven sort of uh, application level traffic or sort of a lower level DDoS or something like that. But you start getting this bad traffic coming in and it's going straight to Fastly. So we send that back in the logs to Datadog. Datadog notices something, uh, notices something, and then generates a message, which goes to a system which then calls Fastly API, the Fastly's API. And then Fastly's API, you could do something like uh, block, uh, uh, add, the, um, add the, 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 the attacker's IP address to a block list or, um, and then just send, return them an error or do something even clever, like maybe sort of slow down their connection or something like that, or just send them back garbage traffic. But either way, they stop being able to attack uh, Fastly and that bad traffic never gets back to your server. So that's kind of the power of what happens when you can um, you have the power of what happens at Fastly's Edge platform combined with what, everything that happens, all the power that is available within Datadog's, um, Datadog's system. Uh, but with that, that's just a theoretical demo. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron to, uh, to do a real live demo, uh, which is going to be exciting because live demos are always fun. <laughs> oh, oh, they are. Uh, I guess while I'm getting set up, we have a, a question we could answer in the meantime because I guess this would be good. Why use uh, Fastly for uh, CloudFront? Um, so Cloud, uh, CloudFront is really specifically tied to S3 and is really designed mostly for static uh, content. Um, the Fastly is much more designed to be a platform where you can run code at the edge and uh, 
integrate a lot more different uh, uh, sort of a lot a lot more different kind of uh, architecture types and a lot uh, another a lot of other different um, <laughs> providers. I, that's well, fastly over uh, anybody else. Like I can talk for a long time about it. Um, and uh, if you did want to get in contact, we can. Uh, I can probably I can have a, a much longer conversation. But I think if I started going on about it now, it would be it would get very boring very quickly. Um, but I'm happy to have a longer conversation uh, after Aaron's demo or uh, after this webinar. Okay. Um, yeah. So we can we can always pivot back over to that too. Um, so yeah. So this is. What you're seeing now is uh, sort of my view from uh, Datadog uh, from the, the integrations page. This is what it's talking about with all those different integrations. There are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of them. Uh, so there, a lot of these will get set up out of the box. Uh, so like the Docker and even SSH auto detected one up there was already being picked up by the, uh, the uh, Datadog agent to kind of suggest, hey, maybe we can instrument this for you. Uh, and take a look at you know what's going on and all that. So the Fastly one you will have to do by hand because of the fact that Fastly is on the edge. It's not at your system uh, like Simon was talking about. It's it's out in front of your customers and not necessarily at your data center. Uh, so when you uh, open this one up, um, the there's a, some basic information that they provide there in the overview section. But the configuration was actually really easy to do. Uh, in fact, I've got to update this. Uh, so after the call, uh, there'll be some updates or documentation to make sure it's. Uh, up to date with what Fastly's got. Uh, but I've got that all linked up here. And there's a lot of metrics that come out of here. So I'm not sure if you want to go over some uh, some important ones here, Simon, that would be good to look at. I mean, they're all important, but- uh, <laughs> Of course they're all important, <laughs> yes. I think there's the basic ones that, there are some which are more important for some people than other ones. So there's all the basic things about, obviously like the number of 200s, the number of 400s, the number of 500, uh, 500 errors, so typically 503 errors and stuff like that. You want to look at uh, some of them are broken down. So 403s and 404s are very important. Um, but there's also things like the number of people coming in over TLS, uh, the number of pages which are considered uncacheable. And then if you've got WAF uh, enabled, then a lot of those features are going to be really, really important. Um, and if you've got our image optimization uh, products in, enabled, then some of those stats are going to be really important. Um, and so, um, the, and just to sort of clarify, this is our this is our stats API. This is counters over a certain period of time. Um, so these are prescribed. Like we have these we have these metrics for you. Um, but then with logs, you can do anything you want uh, from from the request and response. But um, basically, I think there's like 120 different variables that we end up saying to you um, over the integration for for the stats integration. But yeah, there's there's uh, quite a bit there. Um, I'm going to show you the uh, the pre baked uh, dashboard that comes in from Fastly automatically. So when you enable the Fastly integration and get it all set up, uh, this is what comes in out of the box. So you already have just these graphs to begin with, but that doesn't mean you can't build your own dashboard or even just clone this one that's already started there and just add the things that you uh, feel relevant to your. Uh, your organization, especially if you have WAF. Uh, for those who don't know that's web application firewall. So if you want uh, Fastly to do some some stuff at the edge for you to, to protect you from from bad people <laughs> or you know malicious actors as we call it and you're you might be wondering it's like this is probably all just bs right well there's an actual live app you can go to this um this will be really fun to see if we have enough traffic that takes the thing down because it's running on one very small container in amazon <laughs> right now <laughs> we uh, actually we did our dry run yesterday uh the container got um uh, stopped and restarted uh, in the middle of our, our sort of live run demo. So it was actually really fun to watch Fastly start reporting 500 errors like almost immediately <laughs> uh, during our, uh, yeah, because live demos, they're, they're really fun. Uh, the app will be a little slow, so you know, because I've got it running in dev mode because there's uh, some debug information about all the different endpoints that are getting hit. And uh, some of these links will just simply not work, and that is on purpose. So if you start hitting weird uh, 500s, it either means the app did go down or we actually put in a breakpoint there to demonstrate how some of the application tracing and everything works out of the box. Because uh, if you go under APM and everything, uh, we're instrumenting all those services uh, right now. And these are all from our demo uh, storefront app. So you know, maybe you have uh, some things up front. You want to see what's happening uh, when customers are trying to shop on your website. This is all going from the e-commerce point of view. Because if, especially if you have a store online, so you, this is, a, is an example of, of a breakpoint we put in where it's going to explode on purpose. So don't freak out if the app is starting to break or shatter on you. We do this on purpose so we can kind of show off a lot of the, the strengths of Datadog itself. 
Um, but with that, I've got actually some load generators that have been kind of producing traffic for me. So that way the Fastly demo looks a little bit better. Um, we show it live on TV here. Uh, so this is uh, straight from the, uh, the stats page. I don't know if you want to talk more about this, Simon. So, yeah, as we said, we've got uh, two sort of two different ways of looking at our stats. We have uh, the historical stats API, which is uh, all the all the data gets sent to a data warehouse and you can explore that at different layers of resolution going back, uh, I think, going back two years. I'd have to go double check that, but um, going back to two years of data. But then we also have the real time API. And one of the reasons why we've got this is uh, going back to what I said about the um, sort of like how the origin story of FASI happened. Um, for me, it was, um, uh, I was working in a previous company and I was trying to update the, uh, the configuration for our CDN and I made a change and it took eight, it was going to take eight hours for it to roll out. And at about seven and a half hours in, we started getting reports that images weren't loading in front for some reason. And we'd seen this before. We'd seen that um, uh, we'd seen that sort of uh, sometimes when a, a configuration rollout was happening, you uh, you basically had like kind of differences in configuration, like different pops in the same region have different configuration versions, and you get these issues, and you had no idea what was going on. And so we waited and we waited and we waited, and like sort of eight and a bit hours, I was looking through the configuration again, and noticed that I hadn't escaped one character in a regular expression, which was embedded in XML. And if you don't know regular expressions, it looks like a cat walked over the top, uh, top row of your keyboard. And encoding that in XML makes it even more verbose. And so I, deploy, I changed this one character, I deployed again, and another eight hours later, everything started working again. But up until that point, I had no idea what was going on. Um, and so what we really wanted was if you are going to be doing, making changes, you're going to be moving sophisticated logic to, um, to the edge, then you really need to see what's going on in real time. You can't make a big complicated change, uh, move a whole bunch of stuff, move your, uh, move your cookie generation logic over to, uh, um, up onto FASI and then just hope that it's all working. You need to see in real time, whether or not you do a deploy, uh, of your configuration and the number of errors, error spikes or the hit ratio goes down. Um, you need to know that in real time so you can either fix it or roll back. And so this, this real time stats API was incredibly important to us. And that was the first thing uh, that we worked with with Databug was that allowing them to also pull from that real time stats API so they could, you could correlate it against all the other stuff that you were doing in Databug. Yeah. So it's a, uh... Pretty interesting dashboard and everything. You can probably tell where my uh, load generators are coming from <laughs> uh, based on the, the global pop traffic. <laughs> but it uh, looks like some people on, on the call are actually hitting it too, which is uh, pretty awesome to see it light up with more requests and incoming stuff. Like, there we go. There's a big spike there just now. So a lot of stuff hey, coming two, in here. Two requests. Big spike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I guess we can uh, pivot over to the, the, the other sort of announcement today. Um, so we're talking about uh, logging and everything within Fastly and how it sort of gets uh, back to, to Datadog. So I'm gonna go back over here to Datadog itself, the dashboard. And if I go into log section here, and pull up uh, log search. So this is the log explorer. So this is incoming live logs uh, from, we've got both our app and all that stuff here, here but uh, on the left, if I pull down source, there is a Fastly section here because we're pulling in all this stuff from the edge. So I can zoom in on just Fastly itself and this is an example of a request here. So this is a lot of the information that you get now from Fastly. Uh, this is all the sort of information about an incoming request, and it gives you a lot of detail here. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about some of this, uh, Simon. Yeah, it's like we're possibly oversharing like on this, but you know, it's one of the things you never really want to do when you're diagnosing a problem is wish you'd logged other stuff. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Obviously, all the basic stuff about a request, so like what method it was, what protocol it was, um, what the URL was, the, what the referral was, but also stuff like how long it took. Um, and, but then also things like what browser it was, uh, what my operating system family it was, what the, whether it's what type of device it was. Um, I think there's a whole bunch of stuff down there about the network, uh, the client, the connection speed. So we know that it was a broadband connection speed. We know what uh, ASN that it was coming over, uh, which can be really useful. Um, we've got a whole bunch of GOIP stuff in there. Uh, we have a couple of different GYP providers to so that uh, to give people maximum flexibility. 
But then everything, including I think down there, you've got things like the, uh, the TCP socket retransmission rate, rate, which can be really useful to uh, do things for like video. Because if you know that somebody is coming on over a connection that has got a really high retransmission rate, even though they claim it's a broadband connection, you know, well, they're probably actually not having a really good experience. So what you can do is transparently say, say switch to lower resolution images or a lower, uh, lower resolution video so that they get the best experience without you having to do anything. But then we send all this stuff over to, uh, to Datalk so that you can do some correlation like, oh, we're getting a lot of errors for people, but it's only people coming in over Comcast in uh, I don't know, Idaho or something like that. Or we're getting a lot of errors because, so for only for people looking at this particular resolution of image or only people looking at um, videos and stuff like that. So you can do some really, really sophisticated stuff. Like we, you know, we can tell stuff like, Oh, this website has suddenly got incredibly popular with uh, people with Android phones in Thailand and stuff like that. And that's stuff, that's stuff that we can feed, you know, sort of it gets fed back to the customer and they can really see in real time, like what's happening with their sites. So. Yep. As, uh, as Simon was talking about that, I'm showing you how you can very quickly just in this sort of uh, view. So if you see this little gear icon here, you can instantly create facets around some of these particular things. Like I just created one just for a network region. Uh, this is where Simon was talking about, you can, you can drill down even into regions. So if a particular subset of customers are having a particular problem, you can drill into that really fast. Um, this could be helpful for some of your support folks or even your developers to know like maybe there is a regional level issue going on with a particular ISP, or it could be, you know, something else going on there with the network side of things, but this will help you see from that edge, all that information that just comes in out of the box. So it's already there. I didn't have to do anything to really, uh, other than just attaching the, the log side of things here. So I could actually show that bit too. Um, but this is where, you know, that, that log information view gives you that sort of initial, this is from the edge, and then you can trace that all the way down into you know, the sort of uh, request path and everything like that too. So this is where you can add in some either security signals. So I can show off the security bit for a little bit before I jump over to the log side. So if I jump over to security signals here, uh, so I've, got, I've been, so part of my load generator too is also to create some malicious traffic. I'm just gonna put that in air quotes there, but when I created some suspicious uh, traffic that would actually automatically trigger it. So out of the box inside of the security uh, section, if you go into there, there's detection rules. Um, we have one from Fastly that's already there pre-configured um, that's based on just known HTTP uh, request providers. And it's not necessarily saying like you're getting attacked, it's just saying that this is a documented known attack vector uh, using some of these particular uh, things. So if you look in uh, to the, the, the baked in one for Fastly, there is already baked in search query uh, some rule information uh, by default we tag this as info because it's just helpful to know it's not necessarily like you're but you can get attacked it could be that someone just set their user agent incorrectly on something or they were using you know some basic security scanner on you uh, in which case doesn't necessarily mean they're they're sizing you up for an attack but it could be something where if someone's doing this pretty often to you uh, this is where a security signal can tell you uh, hey there's something that's uh, not quite right here um, and if uh, the, the thing triggers again, we'll actually see it up at the top. There will be a live tail preview uh, from the log showing each time that security signal hits. But uh, if I can't see that right now, I can go to view signals at the top and that will get me into every time this is triggered. This is just in the past hour, but I know this has been running for a little bit. So roughly every hour or so I've been triggering those signals. Uh, and then I can also look at the past whenever this has actually happened. When I click on those, that gives me access to each of the different signals. So if I pull up this, the, the log sample here, I can then look at that this is the configured service and all that stuff too, but that same log information that we were talking about before, this lets me pivot directly to that. And then from there, I can maybe add in a, an alert for maybe a particular IP that we wanna keep a little bit of a closer eye on, especially if there's something where the same IP keeps doing the same exact thing. So we can look at the related signals here and it's correlated across that particular information. So it's like, hmm, maybe this IP, which I already know is doing this on purpose, but it, it, if it was outside of a demo and all that stuff, this is where you could see like maybe someone's attempting to size you up for an attack or it's something that maybe you just don't want to have them uh, accessing your service anymore. So you can copy this IP, go into Fastly and block it at the origin so they will never be able to access your service. Now it doesn't mean they can't, you know, recycle and get another IP address again, but if uh, they do the same behavior, it'll get picked right back up in the security scanner. So 
uh, we go back over to the configuration side. So let's talk about the logs bit. Uh, so yeah, this is the thing that we're announcing. We have been able to connect with Datadog for a while via Syslog, um, but Syslog is not the best protocol for sending logs over. Uh, it's venerable, but it's not the best because it's very difficult to retry things. It's very difficult to patch stuff up. It's very difficult to be uh, efficient. So uh, we have built a uh, first class integration where we, do, we interface directly with Datadog's uh, logs API. Uh, and it just makes it incredibly easy to get everything set up. You just put your API key in there. You choose which region you want to go to. And again, this is something that's incredibly useful for people who are, um, who are really GDPR um, sensitive. So the, you could have stuff that says, well, I want everybody going into, you can see the massive configuration option that, you've, uh, that we've got there. Um, you can do stuff like say, well, I want uh, all my East Coast, all my European users to only go to European, lo uh, lo um, European pops, fancy European pops, and we only want to log to Datadog's European server, but everybody else can go to uh, Datadog's, we, we, everybody else can use whatever uh, fast pops they want, and they can uh, log to the US region. So there's some really, really powerful stuff in there. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is now released as of today, uh, and hopefully it should just make things really easy along with the integrations that Datadog have done to make it to, to combine the two services together. Yep. Yeah, the, uh, the the documentation update is forthcoming. I'll do that after this call. So just th this is literally being released as of today. So uh, <laughs> it's a little hard to, to catch up on it and make sure I had everything uh, correct in our documentation. So I promise to do that for you folks. It's been a crazy <laughs> couple of months. <laughs> uh, yeah, to say the least. So, all right, we've got another uh, question here. And this one will be interesting. Is uh, Can you go over how Datadog uh, real user monitoring works with Fastly? Um, so that one, I actually, I couldn't entirely answer for you. So that one I'd probably have to do uh, off, the, off the air here, maybe follow up with you folks. Um, because uh, the real user monitoring side of things uh, would still be, it's like Fastly would still be pulling this stuff at the edge and at the cache. But I'm not sure how much farther we can go in from that point onward. Because uh, yeah. the real user monitoring starts from sort of when the browser uh, pulls up your information. So Fastly would be there to serve that content. But at that point, it just depends on from your browser and how it hits into the core. So we'd still see that entire life cycle. Um, but I'm not sure if there's more specific detail that you're looking at for that. Yeah, I guess what you'd have to do is the, uh, the run product we're running in the browser, it's sending it back to Datadog. But there may not actually be a request going back from uh, there may not be a request going back from your origin server. So you'd have to correlate uh, your logs in your origin server, the logs from Fastly, and the real user monitoring, and then do some sort of cross correlation on that. Yeah, I didn't have any time to sort of attach the real user monitoring into the uh, the the store dog application, uh, so that that it's going to get added in, I think, at some point uh, soon, because real user monitoring is also a somewhat of a newer product from us, um, so that I didn't have, uh, you know, admittedly didn't have ready for this demo. Um, but that's something we can definitely follow up with you uh, off uh, off the air for this. That's a very good question, though. So, but I could definitely see it being something where because the real real user monitoring, like I said, lives in the browser from the customer side of of things. Uh, so I think that coupled with like the fastly logs and stuff like that, you can see if other the problem is within the customer's browser and how they experience things, or maybe it's somewhere more of a usually it's a network layer issue. <laughs> Just give you the spoiler alert now. It's probably networking. It's usually networking. I'm sure Simon will tell you that too. Or DNS. Yeah, it's always DNS. That's always the default answer. It's DNS, right? Or somebody with a backhoe going over a uh, a fiber cable in the middle of the country. Uh, those are the, those are very common things. Or people shooting at um, shooting at cables. That's, that's always an interesting one. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, shooting at 5G towers. We've actually seen problems because sharks eat cables because apparently they're attracted to electromagnetic fields. This is a weird thing. These are not problems I ever thought I'd have to deal with in my life. But yes, now we have to worry about eating our cables. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, if there's any more questions, please go ahead and pop them into the, uh, the Q&A. If not, then uh, really thank you for, for swinging by the, the, the webinar and the demo here. I'm very happy that we got the, the, the new logging stuff in here. Um, like I said, I, I just set this up. Uh, I think you you deployed it and everything was it not even last week and then I had it in just a couple of clicks uh, ready to go in the application so I'm really pretty happy with how the logging stuff works out of the box it's just amazing the amount of detail that's in here 
Uh, and Brandon, who asked the question over Fauci over CloudFront, I know I probably wasn't, that probably wasn't the most satisfying answer. Uh, if you did want to follow up, uh, I'm just Simon at Fauci.com. So uh, you can mail, I was, I would always say it's, it's always one of the benefits being the co-founder, I get to be Simon at Fauci, but we've actually never hired another Simon. So even if I was joining today, today I'd still get that email address. But uh, if you did want to follow up, then uh, then feel free to um, to email me and I can answer a more detail, I can answer in more detail. Cool. Yeah, I'm glad that everything is still holding up too. This is wonderful. <laughs> uh, there's uh, another question in the Q and A, Aaron. I think oh, cool. probably for you. But you're monitoring east west container traffic and applications like content caching. Interesting. Okay. Let's see here, east west container traffic. Oh, okay. So you're talking about uh, cross data centers and regions. I guess you could say. And applications. Oh, okay. So, well, to try to decipher more of your your question here. So, uh, are you talking as in like across sort of regions? So, I guess if you're in say like, for example, Amazon US West and US East, um, you want to look for container. Okay, gotcha. So, cross container traffic going on between the two. Um, so, this is yeah. I guess from the Fastly perspective, I mean, if you're talking containers talking to themselves directly. Um, that would be something that you can log in uh, your container metrics and all that stuff too. Uh, so in terms of looking at, I'm not sure if I have, well, I guess since I only have this in one region right now on Amazon, I don't have this distributed. <laughs> It'd be better if I had a distributed, I could show you. Um, but I don't have like the network level monitoring turned on because it's just sitting on the Amazon container uh, hosting service. So I don't have any of that detail right now. Um, but if you attach that to your, uh, containers, you can get the actual, um, you know, linked host map and all that stuff too. I think I can show you at least like the APM side of the service map. So this is like all the APM services. There's a similar look to this one here for when you turn on the, the network-based uh, monitoring. Um, so at that point, you'd be able to see cross-regional traffic uh, between the two because you'll see the outbound calls between them. So if you're using something like APM and all that and doing the network level tracing, um, that uh, will show you sort of the traffic going between the regions themselves, um, especially when you go into like the infrastructure uh, map. And if you you know map the availability zone and all that other stuff, right now we don't have any of that mapped onto. So I didn't like you know really configure the agent to give me this super low level detail. I was mainly focused on having Fastly attached to this demo app, not necessarily giving you like all the super details inside of the app itself. We've got other demos for that, um, but this this one is going to be more about just from the front end into your application, what that looks like and being able to see that. So between like, you know, cross traffic things, if I had more than one container here in different availability zones, I could show both of those in the host map and then I could actually uh, dive down into uh, the network map itself and show you like where those those containers actually link to each other. So as you can see here in this sort of visual representation of it, it looks very much like how in the APM side of things when we link services together for doing distributed tracing, we do roughly the same thing for network traffic. So we'll show you ingress and egress as it's coming across. And at that point you can, you can if you attach the region information and say like if you put the default like US West or US East, those will already be there and you can sort by that to see exactly what cross traffic, uh, cross network traffic is going on. So hopefully that answers the question. I can't really do it live on TV for you, uh, but that should hopefully answer that question. If you get more sort of specific, like you need a specific demo, then by all means uh, contact us after the webinar and we will, or at least we can get in touch with you to, to, to give you more of a specific demo around that. Because this, this is a much newer feature that we released uh, earlier this year too, which also includes DNS tracing. Uh, so, because remember, it's always DNS that causes problems. <laughs> it's always DNS and it's never lupus. That's the two yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Those are the two surefire things, right? So, uh, I think you've got another question know. as well. Yep. How can I correlate a header request to another application both deployed in Datadog? Okay. So, uh, let's see here. So, this kind of depends, I guess, from here. So you want to correlate a, a, a header in a request to another application. Um, both of them are in Datadog. So I'm assuming you're do, using stuff like APM and all that too. So in the Log Explorer here, I've got kind of everything all concatenated together at once. But the nice thing you can do in here, even with out-of-the-box stuff, most of it will kind of work together sometimes based on sort of what's logging and what's talking to you. 
um, you have to sort of map and match uh, particular facets as we call them. So the thing that I would be looking for to sort of map those two things, like the header requests, um, would be to make sure that, so from the Fastly side of things, let me just pull Fastly's up. Uh, so we've got Fastly's sort of incoming log, and this is where they would also give us header information usually uh, on top of that. You can also log additional stuff in there too. They have like, like you show you, there's like a huge bit of data here, but there's like the method, uh, protocol, all that stuff. You can probably log and attach different things here. Um, but this is Fastly's view of that data. Um, and then you would want to map that into something else. So this is coming in from, let's see here, I can get the, so this is agent's view. You can look at the observability side of things here too. So this is like, oh, that's a uh, database call. Let me actually zoom back out to all the sources here. So I think from the FASI point of view, probably the easiest thing to do is, because you can log custom headers, what you just do is as the request comes into FASI, you generate a random UID for, um, uh, for the request. And then you send that in the logs back to Datadog. And if you get a cache miss, you send that also back to your origin server. And then that way, Datadog will be able to correlate um, correlate back across everything. And I, I don't I don't know enough about your run products for uh, for my sins. Like you could also send it a response header back to the uh, back to the browser, and that way the run could go and pick it up. And then you could probably you, you could use that to cross correlate across all your different services. Yep. Uh, so the thing I'm missing here that I didn't plug in, I realized I didn't, uh, is so if I go into this is the ECS agent uh, view of things. Uh, this is like for actually running that. Um, what I do need is the load balancer stuff from the Amazon side. Uh, so I don't have the the, the cloud uh, logging stuff attached to this right now. I just realized I don't have that. So all I've got right now is just the Fastly side and then my app. I don't have the thing in between to show me the full handoff there. Um, so that's what I would be looking for at that point. And then what I was trying to explain before is uh, when you look at uh, these particular um, facets here, let me close this all out, let me remove that. So when you look at the incoming facets here um, for the particular things, let me just like, here, let me pull Fastly up here. So on top of Fastly from your edge, so it'd be wherever your proxy is, so if you have an Nginx or whatever your egress is, um, you'd wanna map the uh, HTTP headers and all that stuff into a particular facet. You can correlate them at the same time, so, uh, you know, Nginx, I know, calls an incoming set of HTTP uh, information slightly different than you would get it from, say, an HA proxy or a, you know, other in, uh, ingress or egress. If you're doing the like, Kubernetes stuff, you probably have something like Flannel or whatever that's doing your incoming proxy data. Um, so you need to, once you map those together, usually they're, they're pretty close. Um, but if you need to sort of uh, retool those and everything. We do have a whole configuration. You can alter the patterns to make sure that when you get, so let me actually show you some of the configuration behind the, the scenes here in logs. So in the actual uh, logging pipeline, this is where you want to tweak your pipeline to uh, alter some of the, uh, the attributes and indexes and you can align them once you do that. So that would be like your HTTP headers, especially ones in particular you care about. When you align them all together, then at that point you can get Fastly's so HTTP header versus your Edge HTTP header. And then at that point, you should be able to then pull them all the way in towards the APM side of things when it picks up the actual trace. Um, but at the same time, you're gonna have to generate a trace ID, um, which I, again, I don't have included in Fastly here, but it is definitely possible as so looking at their, their configuration. Um, what you'd wanna do to actually have APM level traces. Uh, so if you have an application, you're doing APM stuff, in order to do distributed tracing, you're going to need to generate a unique ID for that request. And because Fastly is going to be at your edge, you need to configure Fastly to have an incoming uh, header on top of that. And there's actually a way you can generate a unique like UUID. And it will just yeah. have to pass that header down uh, towards your application. So you just want to make sure you always attach it from the edge into your things. And then if you use the same um, uh, header, across all that. I think we have them documented in our uh, Datadog documentation. If you use that correct header and everything from our side, we'll be able to pick up the entirety of the trace from Fastly's point uh, all the way through into the stack. As long as your, your uh, edge proxy passes that same header along, if it just moves everything across, 
you should have a full complete trace from Fastly's edge all the way into your application level traces. But that's the only way that's really going to work correctly. So you're going to need to do a little configuration work in Fastly to make that happen. But I'm sure Fastly's support can help you. Just you want to let them know, hey, I want to do distributed tracing. How do I generate a unique ID in an HTTP request? And then from that point on, you can see from the edge all the way into your app. So hopefully that answers your questions in kind of a roundabout way. It's just because it was, again, something it wasn't set up for in this call, but very, very good question. Uh, yeah, I think if you just Google for Fastly UUID, we have a recipe for how to do that. But then there's also a whole bunch of different ways that you can generate. Um, you can just hash a random number or like hash some sort of combination of the, the request headers. So sort of try and get a stable header. So there's a bunch of different ways and our support would be, um, well, uh, our support and our community forum would also would be really happy to, to help you out with that. Um, so then there's a couple of questions for me. Um, there was a question about what the benefits of switching to the new Datadog endpoint over the old Syslog endpoint. Um, basically, it's just that Syslog is uh, not a, it's, it's not really, uh, it's not really a wire level um, uh, sort of protocol. It's just we open a TCP socket and start sending stuff down to Datadog. And there's no way to know if there's any errors or if there are, uh, if the connection has failed or anything, no real way to retry. And so one of the things that our new integration does is it allows us to retry stuff if there are temporary errors. It allows you to give you much more detailed diagnostics if something goes wrong. Um, and um, it just, be, and we've sort of made it much easier for new people to join. Um, so I think that's probably the advantages. If it's working fine for you, you know, sort of you don't need to change, but um, it also makes it easier for us on the operational level on our, land, our end rather than just sort of, um, so it allows us to monitor much more closely if anything is happening, if there's any problems between our POPs and or what we call our, our log aggregators and Datadog servers, it allows us to spot those much more easily. Whereas if it's Syslog, it's much, much harder for us to, to notice. So it's going to be more reliable for you in the long run. But like if it's when it's working, you probably won't see much of a difference. It's when it's not working, which is when it's uh, when it's going to be better. Um, and so there was a question that said, uh, you heard that Fastly was started on open source. Can you explain what drove that? Um, so a lot of people at Fastly, including uh, me and my two co-founders are very heavily involved in open source. In fact, I met uh, Arta, my one of my co-founders, uh, through the Perl community. Please don't judge me. Uh, he added th he added threads to Perl, and I was running one of the largest, uh, well, the largest Perl user group out of London at the time. Um, and uh, so we've been heavily steeped in open source since since I started, uh, so since I went to university in the the mid nineties. Um, and later he, we both worked at live journal, uh, and six apart. So that was a really, really open source heavy company. I mean, we, uh, we did a lot of work on things like memcache and, uh, muggle FS and, um, the Schwartz and things like that. And, um, uh, um, I, my brain is completely back in gear, man. Uh, funny thing about, um, funny thing about, uh, mobile FS, it's just an anagram for OMG files and gear man is just manager and anagram of ma manager. So um fast we we weren't really good at naming stuff but we did like puns back then um so fast was started on top of varnish um varnish was open source um uh, it was created by uh someone called paul henningkamp for and i'm gonna butcher the name of this horribly for originally for a newspaper called verdens gang in uh norway and um it is um we really believe in open source um we, um, I think it's been a path of good in the world and we feel like we should give back. Um, some of it, we try and give back as much open source as we can. We just open sourced, we, well, not just, but we open sourced the underlying components for our, um, for our edge computing platform, um, which is um, called Lucid. Uh, and we're working really heavily with people like Mozilla to, to work on the WASI standard, which is the WebAssembly standard interface standard. So we really kind of think that where possible, we should open source stuff. We do try and give back uh, stuff back to, to Varnish. Um, and we also um, sort of donate um, sort of money towards that. Uh, we're pretty open about that. Um, there's some stuff that doesn't work. There's some stuff that's not going to work for general people running Varnish that does work for us because not everybody is running a 70 plus terabit per second network. Um, we, uh, we also try and give as much uh, free service to open source projects as possible. Um, so we front things like uh, Ruby Gems, Curl, 
um, a whole bunch of, I, my brain, it's like, there's a whole page of stuff that we try and give free service to a lot of open source things. So basically it came from, we thought Varnish was the best thing out there um, for what we needed to do. We really liked the philosophy behind it. And we really liked the, uh, this ability to script it using VCL, the Varnish configuration language. But also we think that open source is a really, uh, really good thing for the world. So we, we try and support that. I hope that answered the question. I'm on it. Oops, Siri apparently also tried to answer that question. <laughs> Stand by, please. <laughs> we're getting close to time here too. So if you got any more questions, please go ahead and pop those in. If not, then we can always answer them offline. So yeah, I don't think there's any more questions, but thank you so much, Simon and Aaron. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Just a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and we will be distributing it after. We appreciate your time and look forward to continuing the conversation soon. Have a great day.